Hey everybody, my name is Bob Goff and I'm so glad that you're along on this adventure with this undistracted curriculum. We're gonna take you on a ride. We're gonna be talking about the things that distract us, the things that give us more purpose and focus. And I hope that you're gonna find in the stories uh, a little bit of yourself. It says in Matthew 13 that Jesus never spoke to anybody without telling them a story or two. Can't imagine what it would be like going out to dinner with them. It's like, would you pass the salt? He said, you know about salt. <laughs> so the stories are to illustrate points, but here's the focus. I want it to be about you. I want it to be about what distracts you and what you're going to do about it. So I'll tee up the story and you insert yours there. Deal? Sometimes what we can do is spend a ton of time planning and not getting anything done. There's a saying in the South, be where your feet are. And I love that because a lot of times we're not, we're actually somewhere else. Uh, we were filming a, a video for a, a network that has a, a weekly show. And the final scene in this, they wanted me to take all of these helium balloons up to the top of a 60 foot water tank on the property. It sounded like a great idea. And I got to the bottom of the water tank, but I'm looking at these little handholds going up and I'm thinking about, gosh, what moves am I going to make to get up there? And if I fall, can I put the balloons under me and land on them? I bet I was looking up for 10 minutes and something caught my eye. I looked down, there's a coiled rattlesnake at my feet. Oh, that'll keep you regular. And I think what happens is it illustrated for me this idea that sometimes we're so absorbed with thinking about what's ahead of us or above us or around us that we're not actually where our feet are. You wanna have an awesome attitude? be where your feet are, be self-aware, be situationally aware, be emotionally aware, be spiritually aware. That kind of an awareness is gonna pay big times. You know what it's gonna make you? Undistracted. What we're gonna talk about is the things that take us away right now uh, from our attitude. They, they distract us uh, from being the person that God made us to be. And what I've tried to do is uh, go through this kind of a little bit of a checklist in my life so I don't forget the important stuff. Jesus gave a lot of airtime to this. He talked about loving God with your heart and your soul and your mind. He talked about loving your neighbors and like yourself. He talked about loving widows and orphans and doing things for people that were hurting. It reminds me of learning how to fly. Uh, we're out at this beautiful place. This is actually, doesn't look like a runway, but it's a runway. You can actually land a plane here. Not a big plane, mind you, but you can land a plane. And the thing that they teach you about flying is checklists. It's the first thing. There's an acronym for everything. And the acronym I want to teach you about, it's called GUMPS. Uh, see, you're already in ground school. You're on your way. Uh, the first thing you do, you check before you take off in an airplane or land it, is gas. <laughs> Think about that in your life. What's fueling your ambitions? What is it that's fueling your joy? What's distracting you from your purpose? So gas, U is for undercarriage. You, uh, before you uh, land the plane, you need to make sure the wheels are down. Go figure. Every once in a while on the news, you'll see somebody that didn't do the gums check or they missed the U for undercarriage. M is for the mixture, whether that uh, engine is running too rich or too lean. For some of us, you're running like redlining all the time. I'm one of those guys. I'm like, ah, I make coffee nervous. And what I'm trying to do is settle it down a little bit. All this frenetic energy is getting in the way. Sitting down to have a conversation with Jesus about who he wants me to be. P is the propeller. So the, the idea is that you can fan out a propeller. You've probably seen this if you've flown commercially somewhere. The propellers are going, but you're not moving. It's because it's fanned out. And so what you need to do is get the uh, propeller so it's really biting in before you take off or land in a plane. And S is, get this, seat belts. <laughs> <laughs> I've been flying more than one time, I'm a little embarrassed to admit, and I heard whack, 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 and I'm thinking, what is that? It's my seatbelt hanging out the door. <laughs> Don't tell anybody, okay? But what I want us to do is think of a little bit of a gums check when it comes to us being distracted. So what is it that you feel like is your purpose? 
What is it the stuff that makes you jump out of bed in the morning, feel like I've got this thing? What is it that is is taking you away from some of your, your greatest creativity? Is it fear? Is it some relationships? Are you surrounded by some naysayers? What I want you to do is figure out what are the most important four or five things in your life. Uh, your faith, your family, your finances, your fitness, your you you figure philanthropy if you want to start with a PH instead of an F. But what I want you to do is to do a bit of a gums check on that. And but as we take off into this time, I want you to think about what am I doing? Why am I doing? And what's distracting me from my greater purposes? Um, sometimes what distracts us from our purposes are the stories that we've been told. Uh, I don't know if you know who your great grandfather is. I don't. I, I've got a nickel older than him, but it wasn't like he set out to be invisible, but he ended up being invisible. I knew he was a sheriff, I think, at least in Montana. I've just told you everything I know about a 70 or 80 year life. And it, gosh, that was just, you know, not too long ago that he was actually alive and around. And I want to leave something behind for us, but I don't want to leave behind a bunch of fables. Uh, I, in my former life, I was a lawyer and there was a, a developer that was a pretty sneaky dude. Uh, and, and he uh, did something and then he skipped town. He tried to disappear with like, uh, changed his name, took all the money, <laughs> went missing. And we were looking for that guy for a long Long time and I was a pretty good lawyer, but I couldn't find him until I did. You know how I found him? I, I his wife had subscribed to Redbook. It's a magazine, and by mistake, she subscribed under her maiden name, under the former name. And so I found him. I sent him a subpoena for a deposition, and we sat down in this crazy part uh, of Oregon, uh, in a little town, and. We sat down and I asked him a couple questions because I knew if he went missing once, he might go missing again. So I said, like, so, you know, who are your parents and who are your grandparents? Like, we went through the whole family tree. And the more he started talking, the more I started recognizing these names. They sounded really familiar. Get this. This guy is related to me. <laughs> It was a little embarrassing. And, uh, and so now I've been to, uh, raised uh, hearing about uh, a great grandfather of mine, and he had evidently grown up in eastern Oregon. And of all the bad luck, he got hit by a train. Could you imagine that? They found him, put him in a wheelbarrow and delivered him to the porch of the, a very no doubt surprised family. And that's how he evidently went missing. Don't let him pick your lotto tickets. Um, so I decided since I was talking to a relative of mine and he lived in Oregon and said, Hey, did you ever find out like where it was that, you know, our kin lived in Eastern Oregon? Cause I'd heard about, you know, the, my great grandfather got hit by the train and he looked at me and he cocked his head. He go like, you believe that? He'd be like, no, no, he ran out on the family. He, he didn't get hit by a train. They made up that story because there was so much shame around that. I'm like, oh my goodness gracious. And so what I want you to do is to find out some of the stories that you've made up about your life. Maybe some of the stories about uh, how you perceive yourself, that I, I just can't be that person or that I need to be quiet or that I need to be like gregarious and loud and silly. Whatever it is, I want us to go back as we're getting undistracted about these attitudes that we bring to life. I want us to figure out the stories that we made up along the way. Some of the stories that could be made in your life are really beautiful ones too. Uh, my grandfather was a uh, fireman. He worked in San Francisco on the piers, uh, the graveyard shift. He worked there on the graveyard shift for 40 years. Here's the crazy part. He never put out a fire. <laughs> I don't even know if he knew how to. But this guy knew how to love me. He knew how to love me like nobody's business. Uh, he, in his retirement years, would make pavers, uh, little cement pavers. He had small medium and large size, kind of like pizzas, but they were pavers. He had a little cement mixer and he would take one scoop of, of cement, three scoops of sand, and he put some rocks in it. And he was just like, for years and years. Now he didn't have a very big backyard. It was probably about the size of mine now and maybe yours, but they were covered with these little trails that didn't really go anywhere. They all interconnected because it was a small backyard. But I'm telling you, he was a guy who loved making pavers. You know why? He made them with me. 
We made pavers everywhere. He had these trails that went to these places. They had me so convinced about this beautiful life they lived. I, I, I It sounds like I'm boasting, but I grew up in a castle. Uh, isn't that crazy? Uh, but it was a track home to anybody else. But my grandparents told me that they lived in a castle. And to the chagrin of every neighbor in every direction, they painted it candy apple pink <laughs> with white trim. Because <laughs> they said that's what castles look like. They had a drawbridge. Now, theirs wasn't hinged at the bottom like you've seen in the movies. There was hinged at the side. It looked like a door to anybody else, but I was convinced that this was the drawbridge to that castle. They had fish in their pond that were made of gold. I didn't know how they floated, but these goldfish, they had people make dinners for them. They, they were TV dinners by anybody else's definition, but they said, we have people make our food for us. I thought my grandparents were loaded. And you know what? They were because they were undistracted by what the world called wealth. They, they were captivated with the purpose of loving me. They loved me the way that God loves me. They, they loved me unconditionally. They showed up with me. They, they made a beautiful stories, not the dark ones like had been passed all, along in my family before. They made beautiful news stories. I mean, who lives in a castle? Uh, and I want us to do that. We have that kind of power and agency if we're undistracted. Because distraction comes at a high cost. You may not know the cost of your distraction in your life, but think about it. What is it costing you to be distracted by an iPhone and this and that and old relationships that aren't squared away and new ones that are crazy? And I just think it's just costing us a ton. Uh, there's a, uh, a high school woodshop teacher I had. I love shop. Growing up, I, I had every shop. If I could have done shop, shop, shop instead of English and math, I would have done that. I wouldn't be able to spell cat, but I wouldn't know shop. I was in metal shop, wood shop, you know, electrical shop, everything. There was a teacher of mine. His name was Mr. Hodgkins, and he was the wood shop teacher. And he was actually kind of a cool dude. He he had blue jeans. He had a big beard with some shavings. Always there's some always some wood chips in it, and he wore Pendleton shirts. He was a cool guy. And I remember getting to the first day of wood shop, and he had this amazing kind of down south accent that I couldn't even pretend to mimic, but it was just for like so homey. So he would take us around at the beginning of the semester and he would say that, you know, this is the drill press, but he'd say it with a big old draw. This here is a drill press. And he would go to the sanding machine, all that. We got to the last stop. It was the, uh, the blades that would come out of the table saw. And he say he came up to this table saw with a kind of a reverence. He said, now this, you need to take really good care that you are not distracted when you're using one of these. The thing about Mr. Hodgkins, uh, he had a couple fingers missing on one of his hands and he never gave me the details on it, but I put it together when he started patting the, the, the table saw and saying, now this one, you really got to watch. Now, all the junior high school, high school boys were around this thing and he turned it on. You could hear all these blades coming up and he started turning this handle and raising the blade and he, he put a piece of wood through it. And he said, now when you get the wood just far enough and your fingers are getting close, you need to get the push stick. Now he had an accent, so he didn't pronounce it push stick. He called it a push stick. <laughs> He said, get the push stick and put it through. Well, evidently he had not gotten the push stick uh, one time uh, because uh, he lost a couple fingers because of it. But you know what? I trusted him more because he was authentic about it. I didn't trust him less. Well, some of our failures, some of the setbacks that we have, 2 Corinthians 1, 3, and 4 says this, that God comforts us in our failures and our time of, of sadness so that we in turn can comfort other people with the comfort we got from him. Now that's a long way of saying, don't be taken offline by the setback. Mr. Hodgkins wasn't. Because he loved woodworking, he made me love work at woodworking. Because he got distracted and lost a couple fingers, he made me more careful. And I didn't.
It's turning something around. It's turning a distraction in your past into a beautiful, bright future. Uh, my daughter, when she got married, I had told her since she was the size of a trout that we would make a chapel. We'd build a chapel for her to get married in. And I'd do it with the guy she was going to marry. And I told her if he asked me and I like him a lot, we'll build the chapel. And if I don't like him, we just won't get around to it. <laughs> and so this guy said, okay, can I marry your daughter? And I said, I don't know. Can you build a chapel? And he's like, wait, what? <laughs> and so for the next six or eight months, we spent some time together building this chapel. And there was a time where he had the table saw out and I was on the other side of the chapel working on something. I heard the blade come on and I remember shouting at, get the poo stick. <laughs> <laughs> this is 30 years later. And you know what? Because there was a guy who loved me well, who was undistracted, but was willing to get real about the time that he was, uh, I was able to do something nice for the next person. That's 2 Corinthians 1, 3, and 4. When you're on tone, everybody else is on tone. You wouldn't be the person in the library that's just goofing off. The person that is studying makes everybody around them want to study. I'm not saying do away with fun. I'm saying be undistracted. Hey, welcome to the adventure. We're going to tell some stories. I hope there'll be stories that tap you on the shoulder and remind you about the importance of an undistracted life.